Hello, everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us today. My name is Simone and I'm community manager with the UAD marketing team. And I'll be your host today. And I'm delighted to be here today with my colleagues and guest presenters. In our regional program, Dr. Matthew Moreland, who is a senior consultant and phonetics editor, was going to present, but he's unfortunately ill. So Dr. Catherine Sangster has very kindly agreed to present instead. And now, without further ado, I'll leave you with our presenters so they can properly introduce themselves. And I'll hand it over to our first speaker, Dr. Rosemary Hall, so we can begin. So, Rosie, over to you. Thank you, Simone. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's absolutely great to be here. And I'm really delighted to have the chance to talk to you today about Bermudian English in the OED. I'm going to start off with a quick introduction to Bermudian English, um, addressing some key questions like, what is Bermudian English? Um, why study it? Where did it come from? How did it form? Um, and also, what does describing a variety of English or any language variety actually involve? Um, I'll finish off with a very brief ov overview of, of what my research was all about. So you might be thinking, um, <laughs> sociolinguist is a, is a job title I've not heard before. Um, what's the point of studying languages and language varieties like Bermudian English? Um, and the answer to that is that linguists essentially study dialects to understand more about how language works, um, the mechanisms of language change, what happens to language varieties when they come into contact with each other. Bermudian English as a 400 plus year old dialect has a huge amount of very rich insights to, to offer linguists when they're asking these kinds of questions. English in Bermuda has an incredibly long history and it's probably the first place um, outside the British Isles where English was spoken except for Jamestown, Virginia. There's another important reason that's quite close to my heart um, for studying Bermudian English and that's getting the facts straight. <laughs> Um, I'm sure that all the Bermudians in the audience here will agree that um, Bermudians are quite sick of Bermuda being missed out, misinterpreted, misrepresented. Um, I should flag now that I will not be answering any questions about the, the Bermuda Triangle in the Q&A. <laughs> um, I, th I think basically a huge motivation for me as a linguist and, and for many linguists working on lesser known varieties of English is, is putting that variety in that place on the map. Speaking of maps, here is one of Bermuda. For those of you who aren't from Bermuda, um, this will really help to pinpoint where it actually is. And it's in the North Atlantic Ocean, right? So it's around a thousand kilometers further north than most people think it is. Um, it's not geographically Caribbean, but it must be said that there are plenty of cultural links um, with Caribbean territories, which of course have linguistic significance too. Um, and Bermuda's geographically remote, as you can see on the map, but it's um, it's not been disconnected from other areas of the world by any means over the course of its long history. It's got a history which, again, is linguistically significant, where lots of different groups from lots of different parts of the world have come into contact with each other. OK, so let's think a, bit, a little bit about the origi origins of Bermudian English. The, the origins of any variety of a language are inextricably linked to the history of that place um, where that variety is found. Um, in Bermuda, um, Bermuda's early history, maritime economy, the context of slavery, Bermuda's position as a strategic military base and its more recent status as a service economy and international business hub have all had an impact on people coming to and from Bermuda and the contact between different groups and the quality and, and nature of that contact. Um, so as always, global politics and local factors that control the movement of people essentially from different parts of the world always play a part. Bermuda was discovered uninhabited significantly in the early 16th century um, and then settled by the British and over 200 years of slavery followed that settlement. Um, Bermuda is quite different from other contexts in that it had no indigenous language because there wasn't an indigenous population and that sort of becomes significant when we're thinking linguistically because it means that two different languages probably didn't come into contact with each other in a, in a significant way. Um, it was more a case of 
multiple dialects of the same language, i.e. English, um, from different places coming into contact with each other. So I think if we're going to talk about a triangle, we should be talking about the UK, the US and the Caribbean as a sort of trio of linguistic influences on Bermudian English over the course of 400 years. So how do we go about describing a variety of English? Um, we need to look at linguistic and sociolinguistic factors. All varieties of any language have their own systems of pronunciation and grammar um, and their own vocabulary. So like any other variety, Bermudian English has its own unique combination of sounds, grammatical features and, um, and words, uh, which is where the OED comes in. Um, it's really important to say here that all these different varieties of a language, so Australian English, Jamaican English, South African English, Bermudian English, um, they're all equally valid. Um, everybody, every speaker of every language has a dialect. Um, it's just that some speakers, certain speakers have the privilege of not having that dialect noticed and commented on. Um, so the language, the varieties of a language that have become um, high status have become so through historical patterns of, of uh, power um, and and it's not to do with linguistics, it's, it's to do with history, basically. So all these varieties are equally valid, equally systematic. Um, but besides these linguistic features that, that work in systems, of course, each language context also has its own unique set of social conditions that shape the way that language is used in that context. And we need to look at all of these things when we're trying to describe a variety. So just to... Um, drill down a little bit for the non-linguists among you um, what these different systems mean. So pronunciation, this is what linguists call phonology, and um, this is sounds, um, vowel sounds, for example, the vowel that you use in a word like ba, um, consonant sounds, um, the consonant that you use at the beginning of a word like thing, and lots of different variants possible. Um, and you've got the grammatical system, so this is about word order and inflection, a couple of Bermudian examples for you there. Um, and then words. Often in Bermuda, we've got this lovely sort of contrast between um, whether we've come down on the side of a US or a UK variant, you know, couch or sofa, um, the movies or the cinema or the pictures, um, that sort of thing. And that reflects, again, reflects the history of um, dialect contact in Bermuda, various different influences that have been important at different times in history in Bermuda. And then, of course, you've got the unique local words, um, so words that may not exist in other varieties, um, so such as chingas um, as an interjection, uh, mice to mice as a verb, and so on. Um, my own research is focused on the first of these systems that I'm talking to you about, so the sounds, the pronunciation. Um, and Catherine will explain for us later how this informed the OED's pronunciation model that accompanied the Bermudian batch of words that we added to the dictionary. Um, I think it's really nice that uh, at the moment Bermudian English is sort of enjoying a, a long overdue moment in the spotlight. Um, I'm not the only researcher on Bermudian English by any means. There's been some really important work on the sounds of Bermudian English, for example, by Bermudian scholar Brittany Fubler, who wrote about Bermudian sounds and also lexical patterns, um, so words, in her master's thesis at the University of Toronto. Um, there's been some phonological work by American professor Nicole Holliday. And there's also been some grammatical investigation done by two Swiss linguists uh, called Nicole Abo and Danny Schreier. And um, their work is really fascinating because they're comparing Bermudian word order and inflection with a range of Caribbean varieties and the correspondences that they're finding between Bermudian English grammar and various different Caribbean English grammars really reflect the historical connections that we know Bermuda has with places like the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos Islands. So again, I'm making this point that, that history and language are inextricably connected and linguists are very excited that Bermuda's getting this moment in the spotlight. So beyond the sounds and the grammar and the words of the dialect, there are also sociolinguistic questions that we must ask about any variety that we're studying. So there's a 
questions about distribution. So who is using this variety? Are there differences between groups? Groups based on age, gender, ethnicity, social class, and why? Why do those differences exist? And then there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's stylistic variation. So do people change the way they speak, the way they use language in different contexts? Um, do they change the way they speak depending on who's listening, who the audience is? And, and what do they do with language to create social meaning and why? So we've talked a little bit about what a variety or dialect is, um, why you would study one and how you should go about doing that. And I'm gonna finish here for the moment just by outlining what my own research was all about. Um, my initial aim was to provide a linguistic description of the sounds of Bermudian English, of Bermudian English phonology. Um, and the purpose of that is to lay a foundation for further studies of Bermudian English and to fill the gap in the literature but until recently, until this moment in the spotlight, Bermuda was noticeably missing from the world English's literature. So I was trying to fill a gap, trying to lay a foundation for further study. And there are years and careers worth of, of, um, of study that could be done on Bermudian English. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so my PhD thesis provided this phonological description, outlining all the vowel and consonant sounds in Bermudian English, um, and the way that they're conditioned by the sounds around them, the way that they work, the systems that they work in, um, their patterns, basically. Um, and that was all based on sound recordings that I made with over 80 Bermudian men and women of different ages and ethnicities. And eventually, um, this phonological overview informed the OED's pronunciation model for Bermudian English, which Catherine's going to talk us through later. But there's a second element to my research, which actually became the central focus. Um, and that's that's um, dialect parody. So as I as my research went on, I was building this phonology of Bermudian English. I became more and more interested as I interviewed more and more Bermudians in dialect parody and dialect mocking. Um, I'll speak about it later on. Um, I think it's really important to have this conversation. And, um, we're very, very lucky to have Kristen White with us today to provide some more insights on this topic of dialect parody. Um, but for now, with, I'll leave you with that as a sort of introduction. I hope it's been helpful. Um, I'm going to pass over to Dr. Danica Salazar, the OUP's Executive Editor for World English, to talk to us about the OED's Bermudian English update. Over to you, Danica. Thanks, Rosie. Um... Yeah, uh, and thanks everyone for joining us um, well, this evening for us. Um, yeah, it's really it's it's really a great thing for me to be presenting this webinar along with Rosie because it feels to me like coming a bit full circle because um, it was right after presenting a similar webinar a couple of years ago that um, Rosie contacted me. So it was a webinar where I presented our work on World Englishes in the OED. And right after that, uh, Rosie was in the audience and she contacted me to talk to me about Bermudian English and perhaps a possibility of doing a specific project on this variety for the OED. And I'd already heard of Rosie through our common Oxford connections, but it was really at that moment when I was able to really um, know specifically about her work and as soon as from my first conversation with her, I guess she did, as Rosie said, uh, um, of all the world Englishes that have been studied from uh, the middle of the 20th, cent uh, 20th century to today, Bermudan is probably one of the least studied uh, of these varieties. So even as a world, as world English editor, I haven't really heard much about this specific variety. And but as soon as I, uh, Rosie started talking to me about her research, I realized just how fascinating a variety of, of, of English it was because of its very particular origins, even the size of the variety. So, so it's a very, obviously a very, um, it's a variety spoken by a very, a very small number of people, but, and also it's very long history and it's a very unique social linguistic context. And it was really a great pleasure, very instructive for me to work with a social linguist like Rosie on translating all of these unique, fascinating aspects of Bermudian English into 
entries in the Oxford English Dictionary. So I'm just going to talk briefly about the results of this work that I did with Rosie and other uh, Bermudan uh, collaborators. And, um, and so I'm just going to show you the words that we've included in the update that we ended up publishing last year in the OED's March 2021 update. Um, so the batch was actually very small in relation to the regular um, in, uh, OED updates. So there are only 15 new entries in, in the batch, but it had quite a significant impact when you published it in March, 2021. Um, so Rosie, you wrote the release notes for it on the OED blog, explaining the background of the project and explaining all of the different um, elements that came into the that went into the work and explaining about the background of Bermudan English, and the OED's publication of these entries were covered by widely by the press, especially in Bermuda, um, in the Royal Gazette, the main you know broadsheet in in the country, but also um, online news websites such as Bur News, and there was a lot of conversation on Twitter as well that started when when we published the these fifteen words. Um, so let me just in the next few slides show you what these words are. Um, so we have words like um, uh, ace boy and ace girl referring to close male or female friends. Um, so ace boy is an older word that's actually originally used in African American usage, but it's now more widely used in Bermudan English. And ace girl, it's female um, equivalent, uh, its female counterpart is much younger, so it's, we were only able to date it to 2009. Um, and of course, we had to add uh, entries for the term Bermudan English itself, which is actually older as an adjective. So it was used uh, first um, in, in, in earliest attestations to, um, to describe English people, people of English descent born or resident in Bermuda or those of mixed Bermudan and English descent, but then later on it became to be used, it came to be used to designate the English language spoken or written in Bermuda. And then late in 1933, the noun, the, the, the noun phrase also, also began to be used to refer to the variety of English spoken uh, in Bermuda. Um, and then we also have more colloquial usages, just, such as the interjection chingas, which dates back to the early 1980s um, and is used to express surprise, awe, etc. So some similar to wow and gosh, or um, ver a verb like chops, which reflects um, some commonalities that Bermudan English has with other varieties of British English, so regional varieties of British English um, specifically. So this is a verb that dates back to 1879 and is used um, not only in Bermuda, but also chiefly in the English Midlands and, and in Wales. And it means to talk excessively, to talk nonsense or to chatter or gossip. And then there's also the, the noun form of it, uh, of uh, the verbal noun for it, chopsing, which also dates back to this to 1879. Um, and then the phrase go long, um, which we were able to trace to 1974, which express, which is used to express astonishment or incredulity, uh, similar to phrases like go on, you don't say, or get away. Um, and Gombe is also a very a, a very uniquely Bermudan uh, word that we added in this update. So a Bermudan folk performance or procession consisting of mask and costume dancers, um, accompanied by drums and whistles, traditionally held on Boxing Day and other special occasions. And it's also a word that's used frequently as a mod uh, as a modifier. And it's also used, and the same noun is also used to refer to a mask and costume performer um, in this folk performance. And that usage dates back to 1919. And Greece, also dating to 1984, is a large satisfying meal, um, but also used more generally as a mass noun to refer to food. And gribble as an adjective, um, also dating to 1984, mean, um, means irritable or bad-tempered. 
Um, so my favorite one of this batch is the verb mice. I think um, Rosie has also mentioned it. Um, it's an intransitive verb that means to daydream or to be distracted or preoccupied. And it's you can, usually found it being used in the present participle, so micing, right? And mug is used in Bermuda as an adjective to describe an unattractive, unappealing, or an unpleasant person or thing. And then there's also onion used as a, a nickname for for native or inhabitant of, of, Bermuda, of Bermuda. And wrench is a transitive verb that means to reprimand, re rebuke, or scold, and but can also be used intransitively to mean to complain. Um, and then well is, um, is there is a very specific usage of well um, as an adjective to refer to food that is pleasant to eat, tasty or appetizing. Um, and now, so you can see here that this is a usage that dates back to 1598. So actually to Elizabethan usage of, of, of the word, but that's now already long obsolete in, in British English or, or other varieties of, of, of English, but it's still very much used still uh, in Bermudan English. And another interesting thing about this usage of well, apart from its age, is that um, that ap apart from being spelled as with a W, we have also found evidence of, of this usage of well being spelled with 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 a V, you know, with a, either as V E L L or V A L. And that is we that we found that to be a reflection of the merger of V and W in Bermudan English, which is a characteristic feature of this variety and is often exaggerated in parodies of Bermudan English. And later on, uh, Rosie will talk more about this element of, of parody in this variety. So I hope that uh, just by showing these words, have been able to show you just you know the unique flavor of this. Of, of, of English as spoken in Bermuda. And just as this variety has unique characteristics, it also presented um, us as lexicographers some unique challenges. Because of course, um, as a very specific variety of English that is spoken by a much smaller segment of the whole Anglophone population, we really didn't have as much evidence of, of these words. Um, as we would expect to have in for words that are used in English generally or for larger varieties of English. So that is where really um, Rosie really played a very important role in this work because it was through her that we were able to kind of fill in the gaps of, of the limited evidence that we have. So we she put us in contact with um, with other researchers, um, recommended to us Bermudan authors whose works we needed to look at specifically, and also connected us with the National Library of Bermuda uh, so that we could find the original works that we needed to find some works that, that we needed to consult for uh, when we were working on these entries. Um, yeah, and, and social media really became was very, very um, important to us as well in this work because um, those things, especially for the more colloquial usages, it was really very useful for us to be able to count on posts by, by, by Bermudians on, on Twitter showing, um, uh, the, you know, these words being used in their natural context, just, just the way that, that Bermudians actually use them in their everyday speech. So in short, th there had, um, we have had to invest more effort um, in this variety, but I can say that it was very well worth it. And these 15 entries really um, was very, very instructive for us. And and it really is just goes to show how much impact uh, even such a small vari variety as uh, Bermudan English can have on a historical dictionary like the OED. So I think that it is the smallest variety of English that we have covered in the OED so far. And, and we're very happy to to have it there. And we are looking forward to including even more of this uh, vocabulary in the OED in the future. And I think I'll, head, um, I'll hand over now to Catherine, who will talk to more uh, about the uh, pronunciation of Bermudan English. Thanks, Danica. 
Um, so yes, as Simone said at the start, I'm um, standing in for my colleague, uh, Matthew Morland, who is indisposed and um, unable to present today, but uh, we work on these things together. So I hope I can give a good account of it all. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge that this work is, is, uh, is primarily his work. So when we come to represent the pronunciations for a particular group of speakers, we, we always have, uh, we have a process that we always follow. Um, we start by scoping out the variety um, and looking at who the speakers are, whose speech we're trying to represent. And Rosie's work was really influential with that. So we look uh, geographically, but also we think about um, ethnically, politically, economically, sociologically. We look at things like language contact, look at the relationships between different dialects and sociolects and consider what the hierarchies are, what the convergences and divergences might be and just try and pin down all the different linguistic influences on the pronunciations um, in, a, in this population. Um, so because we're trying to in each case make a unified model wherever possible we're not explicitly in the case of Bermudian English separating um, Black Bermudian English from White Bermudian English although they have been studied as distinct varieties um, but we do highlight where some of the more salient distinctions lie when, while we're trying to represent both. So what we end up with is a model, a single model, that mixes the two. Um, and as I say, much of it's based on Rosie's research, but also um, on some other influences. One of the big challenges when we have pronunciation models, and I'm going to move on to my, my first slide here, um, is uh, that it's not just a matter of listening and transcribing what you hear, you can transcribe the same thing different ways, especially when you're working at a broad level like we do for a dictionary. So we've got to capture the core meaningful contrasts of the variety and the characteristic qualities. So it's got to be, um, you see there, meaningful, faithful, useful. It's got to meet meaningful contrasts. It's got to be faithful to the research that academics have done on that variety um, in a descriptivist way. So we're not prescribing a correct form, we're just saying the way it is. And it has to be usable, and that means usable by a semi-casual OED user. It's got to be practical. There's a certain amount of pragmatism there. Uh, it's got to be consistent, it's got to be predictable, um, and it's got to have a relatively small set of symbols, although you see in a couple of slides time that we did bring in some new symbols, especially for Bermudian English. Um, so we do offer variants where if we did just pick one, that would mean we really weren't, mis <clears throat> weren't fully representing a, a big chunk of the population. But it's important to recognise that each transcription is a bit of an abstraction, um, like a map of the territory of the pronunciation. So like all of our models for English, it ends up in a drafting cycle where Matthew researches as much as he can, proposes a tentative, like a draft version, then we bring it to a specialist consultant, uh, which was Rosie in this case. Uh, they guide us and help us refine it, a bit of back and forth. Um, and then we draft some example en entries, see how it feels, and then we arrive at the model itself. So I'm going to walk us through some of the detail of the, of the model that we've used in OED to transcribe the words that, that Danica was just walking us through. Um, so the next couple of slides are about vowel sounds. And a lot of the vowels in Bermudian English are uh, what we call contextually conditioned. And what that means is that they, they're not always the same, they vary depending on where you find them. Specifically, they often have one form before a voiced consonant in a monosyllable, in a word with one syllable, and the same form in the final syllable of a word with more than one syllable. But elsewhere, they have a, a second form. Um, this is a feature that's sometimes called southern breaking. Um, John Wells called it southern breaking in 1982. Um, and it's it's a pattern that's patterns with some southern US English monothongs, um, which have diphthongal variations in certain contexts. Uh, so an example here is the vowel in the word kit. You can see here um, on the first line, we've got um, bit, but something like beard um, and big, big, like that. Um, so there's a, the, the, 
you've got a further complication there because the the long version, the big one, is the uh, the variation, the variant that um, occurs particularly before G and before ng, the velar nasal, and that's a feature that is more associated with Black Bermudian English than with other other varieties. Um, the second, well, the second two, number two and three here, to, is about um, a merger between the vowels in the words dress and trap. Uh, and again, this is more characteristic of Black Bermudian English. Uh, so you can, um, we've got um, the distinction. Um, so more, most commonly they're monoph thongs, but again, there's this difference that goes on before, specifically before a G. Sometimes we, we create the model to account for all these very specific changes, and then it turns out that we're not trying to transcribe a, a particular word that has any of those things, but it's still there in the model for when, for when one comes along. Um, so another particular difference is the, the op vowel that we have in, like in the word lot, it has got a distinction for at least one of the two varieties covered. Um, same with the vowels in the words price, mouth, goat, that I, ow, o vowel. Um, they're often different in the pre-voiceless consonant environments than in pre-voiced consonant equivalents. And that's what you see in the fifth and sixth line there. Um, in open syllables, uh, pry and now go like pride and loud, but, uh, but go follows the pattern of goat rather than of road. And lastly, on this slide, we've got a distinction between in the E sound between how it sounds in fleece or flea, so before a voiceless consonant or before no consonant at all, where it's quite close and high but not particularly long, whereas in seed, it's more like it, it's a little a little less high, a little more like I, but it has it has greater length, so we transcribe it differently. A few more vowels to go. This vowel, the vowel system is is fairly uh, fairly complex. So for for cut for vowel the vowel and the word cut, um, the rounding is quite minimal, and there are these two variants that we have. For the bath vowel, we've got two two forms, um, both quite long. One further back, more like bath, uh, and one still long but more in the front, so more like bath. Um, there's uh, the quality, now let me, get, let me get them the right way around. Older Black Bermudian English speakers tend to use that more back quality, um, while younger Black Bermudian English speakers and traditional base lexical or White Bermudian English speakers tend to use the other, the other form. There's um, a lot, some roticity, interesting stuff. Roticity is to do with R sounds after vowels. Um, there's an increasing roticity in Black Bermudian English, which Rosie observed, and it's starting to affect the vowels in words like start, north, force. So I don't say them with enough, start, north, force, and so on. Um, and, and that's affecting some mergers in progress. Doesn't seem to have uh, affected everything yet, though. There's a merger between the vowels in nurse, near, square, so that fear, fair, fur merger. And again, that's more characteristic of Black Bermudian English um, uh, but but it, it and we've included it as part of the model. Uh, and last of all, as we run through all the vowels, we've got um, the, the vowel in the word cure, which has a, a really quite a range of different qualities, um, none of which have the following R at, at, at this stage of, of observing what's going on. So I mentioned that we had new symbols. This is very um, exciting for us. Uh, so we already drew on quite a wide range of symbols. Um, and as I say, we don't like to proliferate too much because we do want the models to be usable. Um, but uh, there were two qualities that were so important in, uh, and distinctive, salient in Bermudian English that uh, we wanted to introduce them. So because of the fronting of the OO vowel in goose, we have this, uh, it would regularly be transcribed with just a normal looking U letter. Um, with or without length, but this line through it indicates that it's got, it's fronted, that moves further forward in the mouth. Um, and the other symbol is um, a vowel that's particularly characteristic of traditional base lectal white Bermudian English. This is a much more rounded central monophthong vowel for goat. It's sort of a bit like uh, um, with, with lip rounding. So again, a, a special symbol 
brought in and uh, thanks to our people who look after the technical side of our website display for helping to make those work properly. And we have a third new symbol now, moving on from vowels to consonants now. Um, this, this symbol is the um, probably the most salient feature of all of the Moodian English is the, the use of this merged um, bilabial fricative of uh, um, which for, for words with like wet and vet, uh, it's quite a complex merger um, which goes on and it's really relevant to what Rosie's going to talk to you about shortly um, around um, dialect parody. So uh, we'll come back to that sound uh, in, in, a, in, a few, in a few minutes time. Just to run down some of the other consonant differences uh, or the other consonant features that the model includes, uh, we've got dental fricatives, that's the th sound, but becoming th medially and finally, so in the middle or at the end of words, and similarly th sound in the middle of words, but um, becoming a stop d in initially and v in final position. Uh, then we have the um, taps, the alveolar plosives commonly realised as taps in the in between vowels. Um, and that's a, uh, in order to, we've chosen the symbol D there, not, um, there are other symbols we could have chosen, but in that case, we've chosen the D in order to be consistent with a feature that's quite similar in our US English model. Um, so we're showing word final plurals with, with S, with a voice, a voiceless fricative. Um, that's, that's more consistent with how, how it seems to work. And uh, past tense ed is id and ing is with with in. Um, again, that's that seems to be the most consistent thing. Um, neither of the broad models for the Mutant English have um, linking r. Linking r is when the r is there in the in the spelling, and intrusive r is when it isn't, but you still say it. So something like a, a British English speaker saying law and order or drawing um, with a putting a r sound in, in there. That's not a feature of, of the Moodian English, and so it's not reflected here. Um, and there are some cluster simplifications. So some words like um, products as products, old as old, and so on. And those are, those are where, where they're felt to be the most common realizations of those pronunciations that's reflected in the model too. So here are some of the transcriptions for the words that you'll recognize from earlier in the um, in the webinar. Here's the, the transcriptions that we've used. Um, I want to say, as we look at these, that, that it's also the case that there are distinctions that that aren't reflected in the written transcriptions, but you can hear them in the audio recordings when we when we provide those alongside. We saw the examples here. I can return to talk about some deep detail of that if anyone wants to pull out anything particular in the question session. Um, and I'd just like to end by saying that these, you know, these are the, the sources on which we based the work. Um, and um, thanks to thanks in particular to Rosie, because there wasn't a, a great deal of other work to go on. So her research has been absolutely invaluable in doing what we needed to do to make the transcription models. So I'm going to hand back to Rosie now, who is, um, as I was saying, is going to talk some more about dialect parody and maybe that birth sound in particular. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so I want to talk to you about, about dialect parody now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I became increasingly interested in the linguistics of dialect parody as my research in Bermuda progressed and eventually it became the focal point of my research. So just to start off, um, first of all, what is dialect parody? Um, dialect parody is basically doing an impression of a dialect with the intended purpose being humour. Um, it's incredibly common, um, we've probably all encountered it, I'll wager everybody in the audience has come across this in any variety um, that they've come into contact with. Um, it happens all the time in stand-up comedy, happens very often in everyday life. Um, there's probably someone in your life who you think of as being good at accent. Um, that's dialect parody. Now, linguists are very interested in dialect parody because it reveals a lot of really interesting information socially and linguistically. 
Um, so for example, it can tell us about attitudes towards that dialect, how it's viewed socially um, when it's being performed. Um, it's also, it can be quite useful in identifying which features of the variety are salient, are noticeable um, and important, especially features of the variety that are noticeable to non-speakers, for example. Um, as to this question of, is it bad? Should it be stopped? Um, linguistics has a part to play in answering this question. Um, one of the key features of linguistics is that it is not prescriptive, just like the OED is not um, a rule book. It's, it's a reflection. It's a record of what is rather than a, a rule book for what should be. Um, linguists are not the language police. Um, Linguistics is about the objective scientific observation of patterns in language structure and usage. And so linguists can't dictate how language is or isn't used. Um, we wouldn't dream of telling people to speak one way or another. But what linguists can do um, through studying things like dialect parody is they can shed light on what it means to imitate or perform a language variety. We can look closely at who's performing, who's being Im imitated um, and exactly how, and that allows us to get a better understanding of the social meaning behind different types of dialect parody. Um, we can also use um, audio analysis software um, to, to really closely analyze the audio, the sound files um, of recorded dialect parody to figure out exactly what is going on when people, people do dialect. And that's something that I've done. You can. Um, you can compare people's so-called so normal speech to their performed speech to see whether they're doing, whether they really are doing a parody of themselves or they're doing a parody of somebody else who has features of, of um, their variety that um, the performer does not. Um, so linguistics can do a lot. We're not telling anybody what to do or what not to do, but um, I think we have an important role in shedding light on the meaning of things like dialect parody and all sorts of other linguistic practices too. Okay, so dialect parody in Bermuda. Some of these examples of dialect parody, I think might look familiar to the Bermudians in the audience. Um, and for others, I'm sure you can think of equivalents for the varieties that you're familiar with. Dialect parody can be spoken or it can be written, it can happen in public or it can happen in private. Um, in terms of spoken dialect parody, as a white person without Bermudian heritage. Um, my parents moved to Bermuda in the 1980s and I was born there, lived there for about 10 years and then came back in my in my 20s. Um, as someone who grew up in that context in Bermuda, I knew that spoken dialect parody of Bermudian English was a thing. Um, and when I started to research Bermudian English phonology, I noticed that it started to happen spontaneously in a lot of my interviews with people. Um, and it happened particularly often with interviews with white Bermudian men who were over the age of about 50. And so I wanted to get to the bottom of this. I wanted to look at, at the social meaning of this, um, not from my perspective as a Bermudian, as a person who has experience there, but as a linguist, as somebody who is trying to objectively analyze what exactly is going on socially and linguistically when people do Bermudian English. So I started to interview people in Bermuda who are well known for their dialect performances to try and get to the bottom of this. And I also looked quite closely at written dialect parody, which became relevant when working on the OED batch. I've seen a few people have been asking in the questions, you know, what evidence do you use to, to date an entry or to, to create um, entries in, in the Oxford English Dictionary? And, and the OED is a historical dictionary, it uses written evidence. So unfortunately, we can't use spoken evidence. I started to work with the OED who use written evidence um, to date words and to research words and, and to think about the history of those words. Um, so written evidence is important when you're making dictionaries. And it's, it's tricky in Bermuda because although Bermuda has an incredibly thriving literary scene, it's just a fact of life that if you have say 60,000 speakers as opposed to several million, you're not gonna have as much to work with. Um, so sometimes we encountered this problem of what do we do if the only written example of a word that we can find that we know is in common spoken usage 
what if the only written example we can find is parody, what do we do with that? And, and how do we make sure that we're representing Bermudian English authentically? Written dialect parody presents some advantages, but mostly challenges, um, as you can probably guess is, is my viewpoint, um, particularly in terms of how it attempts to represent pronunciation. So on the one hand, dialect parody, like what you saw in the previous slide, um, can be useful in identifying key features of a dialect, the salient features, but it's really not very reliable evidence for lexicographers, for dictionary makers. It's really difficult to know exactly whose usage is being represented and how faithfully. Um, dialect parody, usually nine times out of 10 is a huge exaggeration, and it's also nine times out of 10 an imitation of a dialect that the performer does not normally use. Um, it's also crude. Um, we can't represent pronunciations very accurately at all using the alphabet. Um, often spelling simplifies things and obscures really interesting complexities, such as um, the, the use of the were and the bilabial fricative that Catherine was telling us about just now. So let's talk about the example of v and w in Bermuda. Um, in fact, this is a really, really fascinating feature of Bermudian English called what linguists call a merger. So what that means in Bermuda is that Bermudians are not getting V and W confused in any way. Um, they're not simply substituting v for w and w for v. Um, they're using those sounds and this bilabial fricative interchangeably in different contexts. Um, and this is, a, this is a feature unique to Bermuda, but in, in a subtly different way, it does also occur in different parts of the Caribbean. But Bermuda's particular way of doing it is unique and it's really interesting and linguists are very interested in it. Um, if all you can do is use, when you're, when you're doing written dialect parody, you only have the alphabet at your disposal. So what happens is what you can see on screen, simplifications with v for w and w for v. Um, so this evidence is, is going to pose a problem for a lexicographer because particularly when examples come from a parody source, um, we're not sure what to make of this. Is this really the way things are uh, pronounced? And it's not. Um, is it done all the time? or just some of the time. Um, differences will be simplified, exaggerated for some supposed comedic effect. Um, and so we have to be really wary of this type of, of evidence as lex lexicographers. Um, and as I said, we could just choose to avoid this type of evidence altogether. And I think if we were working with a larger variety, we might well have done that. Um, but because the amount of written examples of Bermudian English is scarce. You know, if you're looking for an example of a particular word, you may not have that much choice. Okay, so um, I want to move on. Carrying on from, from this of a word example, um, you can see another example of that in the in uh, what you're looking at here, which is um, a serialized publication of a parody in Bermudian dialect written of Alice in Wonderland um, from the summer of 1924, published in the Royal Gazette. Um, <laughs> this is, it's an extraordinary um, piece of writing. Um, and for example, in the, in the title and in uh, phrases like voluminous weeping, spelled in the way that you can see it there, um, v and were is, is parodied. And again, that's simplifying and not particularly useful evidence for us. Um, but there's more that I want to pay attention to here, more things that are going on in this type of written dialect parody. Um, note the ideology of um, what we call I dialect, that's E-Y-E, -E, so dialect that you can see. Um, in words like those words at the bottom, so figures, biscuit, ingredients, honour, co committee, um, this is social symbolism. There's nothing linguistic about this. There's that actually spelling figures, F-I-G-G-E-R-S, um, doesn't alter the way that you pronounce anything. It's just using non-standard spelling. And the effect of that is um, what Alexander Jaffe has called the social symbolism of orthographic choice, the social symbolism of spelling. Um, and that reveals the attitude of the writer 
um, towards the represented speaker. And if you're using non-standard -sp spelling, essentially, you're probably suggesting that the speaker is uneducated in some way. Um, now, if we look even closer at the content of this parody, um, we find that um, it's undoubtedly harmful and racist. So this uneducatedness that is implied by spelling honor, H-O-N-N-E-R, or spelling figures, F-I-G-G-E-R-S, um, is this uneducatedness is, is linked to blackness um, in this piece of text. So the writer describes Alice's voice as dark brown. Her voice sounded thick and very brown. The words did not come as they used to. And then what's really um, concerning is that this, um, these features, this, the blackness and the uneducatedness are, are linked essentially through this type of language parody. So um, Alice is created as a figure who is drunken and stupid and lazy, doesn't do her job properly. Um, and the Royal Gazette, which was formerly known as the Royal Gazette and Colonist, I should add, um, its history as a, as a white readership newspaper um, and in 1924 means that this almost definitely was written by a, a white male writer. And um, it's undoubtedly part of a vogue that existed for writing so-called Negro dialect in the 19th and 20th centuries that a number of American academics have looked at um, and uncovered. Okay, so I'm afraid what's, what's rather astounding is that just the same sort of thing still happens today. This is not 1924, this is nearly 2024, um, but it still happens today in written and spoken contexts. Um, and in my research, I've found exactly the same system of linking linguistic features to blackness and then in turn to negative personal qualities um, in the spoken dialect parody that I looked at and recorded. Um, so if we look closely at the content and the context of the parody, it helps us to understand um, this meaning and to, and to extract it and identify it. So I looked a lot more closely at the content and context of these types of performances. Um, and this kind of analysis made it clear that this, this is not flattery in its purest form. This is not imitation as the purest form of flattery. This is very thinly veiled way of reinforcing racist stereotypes about black Bermudians. Um, the white speakers who were doing this were creating personae who had undesirable personal qualities and habit, habits such as joblessness, involvement in crime, swearing and alcoholism. Um, and they also mocked political opinions that are more commonly held by black Bermudians, such as pro-independence. Um, and I think the, the response I often get is that, oh, you know, these people are mocking themselves. They're not mocking black Bermudians. They're mocking, white people have, have an accent too, and they're, they're mocking themselves. White Bermudians do have an accent, but it's been shown by linguists, including myself, that there are many, many differences between black and white Bermudian speech. And that's unsurprising given the history of segregation and slavery in Bermuda when pe when groups are not in frequent contact with, with one another the way that they speak diverges that's why people in the north and south of England sound very different from one another um, so we can also as I said you can also test to see whether people are mocking themselves and and they're not and, and actually they tell me that they're not in sometimes overt and sometimes covert ways often when they engage in a performance of a dialect, they will say, oh, explicitly, this is how a black person speaks, and then they will give a performance. Sometimes they'll do it more subtly and it will be through referencing the neighborhood that that person lives in, um, or as I said, through referencing their, their politics. Um, so what I want to say is that when we look at di dialect parody, it's, it's really essential that we take context into account. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to warn you about the next slide. It um, contains an, a written example of spoken dialect parody that's not pleasant and that is fairly overtly racist. So um, this is your chance to look away. And for the same reason, I've chosen not to play an audio example of, of this piece of dialect parody. 
So this is the type of thing that I encountered very often in my interviews with white comedians. Um, the bold text is where the speaker switches into his version of a black Bermudian accent. Um, and he's mocking um, nationalism in Bermuda, he's mocking um, a pro-independence stance, a pro-Bermuda as a nation stance. Um, and then in that bottom quote, you can see that somebody's talking about somebody else's language and how they can put it on. Um, so, <laughs> Bermudian politics um, is very racially polarised and Bermuda has a problem with racial inequality and this is really reflected in parodies. Parodies take part in debates about immigration, about cultural citizenship and about belonging in Bermuda. And this type of dialect parody contributes to a very specific Bermudian debate that's very sensitive about who gets to call themselves Bermudian. Here's an example um, of some dialect parody that's that's written, but also spoken. You can buy a CD um, if you so wish. Um, Jeremy Frith, now deceased, was a Bermudian poet, a white Bermudian poet, whose work is often cited um, in the Royal Gazette um, when there are debates about race and immigration in Bermuda. Um, and his written poetry is full of I dialect, similar to what we saw with Alice in Wonderland. Um, as you can see in, in the title of his book, Oh God, I Wish This Ignorance Would Stop. Um, now to me, um, and I think to many Bermudians, this is an eye-watering piece of uh, colour blindness um, that fails to acknowledge the very different circumstances of black and white Bermudians arrival on the island. I think Frith's basic point um, is that Bermuda was uninhabited when it was discovered, so everybody on the island is equally from there and not from there. Um, but this fails to, to acknowledge that black and white Bermudians' arrival came about under very different circumstances and, and ultimately those circumstances are very, very closely linked to the reasons why black and white Bermudians do sound different today. Um, I think it's also incredibly um, self-contradictory, this type of dialect parody, because um, the message, as you can see in that extract, is sameness, you know, we're all the same. But the humour is based on stark differences between Frith's normal speaking voice. Um, he also tells, he, he does poetry about the environment, which is spoken in his in his own speaking voice. Um, but the political stuff is like this, and it's voiced in a very exaggerated Black Bermudian accent. Um, so <laughs> you can't claim that everybody speaks the same and everybody is the same, and then base your humour on this really stark contrast. Um, at least I think um, you can't. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering whether a question in some of your minds, um, and it's certainly a question that I come across quite often, is isn't this just harmless fun? Um, is it so terrible? Now what I would say in response to that question is this. Um, Number one, no dialect is objectively funny. Um, as I said earlier, they're all equally valid systems of pronunciation, grammar, words. Um, they come to have status or low status um, because of history and politics. And I've told you a little bit about the history and politics of Bermuda today. Um, and number two, it's really important always to look deeper, look more closely at a piece of dialect parody to ask what's really being made fun of. And more often than not, it's not just about making fun of a variety um, or the way it sounds or the words, it's about making fun of the speakers of that variety. And commenting on or performing language can be a proxy for and much more socially accepted than commenting directly on something else like race, gender or social standing. So I want you to look back um, and think of the last time you heard a piece of dialect parody. Was the character that was being performed intelligent, hardworking and successful? Or did they have less admirable qualities? And if you are thinking, well, I've described the performance I have in mind of being, I'd describe it as being affectionate. I want you to ask yourself whether it could 
as well as being affectionate, be simultaneously patronizing in some way. Now, dialect parody comes in lots of forms and context is everything. Obviously, there are lots of different types, speakers, context, but ultimately we need to be aware of it as a commonly used way to covertly express prejudice. It's shorthand, basically. It's, it's a lazy shorthand, in my opinion, and linguists have found again and again that dialect parody is not um, is, is often used as a tool of power to demean all kinds of speakers of so-called non-standard English. And this doesn't just happen in Bermuda, it happens all over the world. And finally, I just want to say, um, beware the killjoy argument. Um, Humour can be a really effective excuse or disguise for prejudice, because if you object to somebody's joke, you can be accused of not having a sense of humour or of spoiling the fun. And I think that's very powerful. So bear that in mind. And I think, as I said earlier, as linguists, we, we have to be objective observers. We can't tell people how to speak or not to use dialect parody, um, but we can examine dialect parody and expose the ways in which it's used to reinforce racist hierarchies. And it's very clear from my research that at the bottom of a great deal of dialect parody in Bermuda is white Bermudians and white visitors making fun of black Bermudian speech. It's essential that we're aware of this linguistic and political situation when we're using written source material to create dictionaries, um, whether we're talking about Bermudian English or any other variety. And crucially, we really need to pay attention to people when they reflect on how they experience dialect parody. So here's a tweet that I think is so powerful um, being black in Bermuda is listening to white foreigners mock our accents both on the street and during meetings. And then there's a quote from Kristen White there. Uh, You're lying if you don't acknowledge that the slang and accent comes mostly from a certain community. Um, and with that, I'm extremely privileged to hand over to Kristen herself, um, who I believe is going to tell us the story. Thanks, Rosie. Good afternoon, everyone. So I've written a piece called To Quiet the Kahal. When man first encountered the island of Bermuda, they were met with an eerie noise, and it so scared passing mariners that most dared not come ashore. The Kahal, so called because of its howling, the Bermuda petrel, a bird that lives at sea, each side of its brain awake and shifts to allow it to sleep on the air and it lands only on this island. A million of them in the sky produced a screeching cacophony that sailors believed were the screams of the devil himself. For over 100,000 years, this was the sound, the unique sound of Bermuda. When I was about seven years old, I spoke at church and at the end of the service, a visitor, a black American woman complimented me on my participation. I love your accent, she added. I ran to my mom all excited that this random woman was able to uncover my hidden nationality. My father's American from the South and technically so am I. I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas and moved to Bermuda when I was a year old, and hadn't been back since. Mama, she knew I was American. What makes you say that, she asked. She said she loved my accent. My mama laughed. She meant your Bermudian accent. I was confused because to me, accents were what other people had, what my daddy had. At that stage, I hadn't seen him for some time, but I remembered how he spoke and figured, hoped some of his twang must have rubbed off on me. The way I said I was going down the road, up the hill, that was not an accent. Bermudians don't have accents, I responded. My high school English and drama teacher was adamant that down the road was incorrect. A black Bermudian woman who valued the Queen's English, she taught us to read with enunciation and speak in colloquialisms only as part of character. As a teen, I began to switch off my accent in the presence of white people or in more formal settings, which was generally the only time I spoke to white people. And it was in my 20s that switching up my accent became second nature. As someone new to the workforce, I assimilated. No one else around the boardroom table had an accent, a Bermudian accent, not the black people, not the white people. The ability to wipe a bit of my accent away led to a side hustle doing radio commercials, 
producers liked my voice because it didn't sound too Bermudian. The only time I'd be asked to pull out a Bermudian accent was for comedic purposes, and I did. In my 30s, serving on a government board, I would notice that one of the other members, a white Bermudian, would put on a Bermudian accent whenever she wanted to mimic someone who she thought was not bright or trying to scam us, even though it was based on applications, so we didn't know who the people were or how they spoke. It used to bother me so much, but I didn't call her out on it, and I regret that to this day. Earlier this month on a diversity and insurance panel, a black Bermudian who works in that industry called it exhausting, having to constantly code switch. He doesn't even know when he does it anymore, he said. And now I don't even know when I'm doing it anymore. An audience member at that panel commented that she feels code switching is more insidious than just your accent, that code switching forces you to erase who you are. And of course she's right which is why when the accent, when Bermudianness is trotted out as part of marketing or mimicry or merchandise, it feels violent. Like something's been forcibly taken from me, stolen so it can be sold to others. Last month, I did a history tour for a group of black American women. And one of them asked me, why do I sound so British? That I didn't seem to have as strong a Bermudian accent as other people they'd met. What could I say? That here I am now in my forties, and even though I work for myself and I'm at the stage in my life where no one would dare suggest I wipe the salt off my tongue, yet I can't help it. That I hope I really do that I can read this story with my real accent, the accent of seven-year-old me, but that I've practiced this reading and notice I continue to switch out of it. So I'm pretty sure I can. And that makes me heartbroken. I've accidentally quieted the cajal and I struggle to find it again. 16th century Spanish explorer Diego Ramirez and his crew devoured thousands of cajals and brought away more than 1,000 well dried and salted for their voyage. The English arrived in 1609 and they too soon discovered the cajal was not a demon but a tasty morsel. After they settled the island in 1612 and the cajal was a major food source, the governor saw fit to protect it with one of the world's earliest conservation decrees. The proclamation against the spoil and havoc of the cajals didn't work. Groups of settlers even moved closer to the bird's habitat, an island across the harbor outside this window, to hunt them in larger numbers. Between the humans and other species introduced by them, rats and hogs, the cajals were decimated and at that time last reported seen in the 1620s, only a decade after man made this island home. I started blogging several years ago and have written several pieces about race, culture and history and quite a few about the Bermudian accent. Dark and Stormy, July 2017. A video was featured for the America's Cup, a high profile, huge international sailing race that Bermuda hosted. It showed an Australian journalist learn how to make Bermuda's national cocktail, the dark and stormy. But to our chagrin, he wasn't taught by a Bermudian bartender. A bartender is a generally a category that's not eligible for work permits. So uh, there really shouldn't be a non-Bermudian bartender. But immigration issues aside, it seems silly. Any Bermudian can make a dark and stormy. I can do it in my sleep and not cut my finger slicing the lime. When people commented that the bartender should have been Bermudian, one response was that that was racist. Another poster justified having the non-Bermudian bartender by saying they probably thought no one would be able to understand a Bermudian accent. The bartender in the video was Southeast Asian and of course the journalist Australian, so there were already heavy accents in the video. When pressed on this, i.e. when I said this white woman sounded ridiculous, she said she's been living outside of Bermuda for over 30 years now, so she probably has a more open mind than me. She reminded me of Suzette Lloyd. Between 1829 and 1831, Suzette Lloyd, a white British governess was in Bermuda and wrote letters to friends, which ended up being published as a collection in 1835 called Sketches of Bermuda. She talks a lot about race and her statement that slavery wears the mildest aspect of life in Bermuda became the defining view of enslavement here. Not the history of Mary Prince, a firsthand account of being enslaved in Bermuda, no, the story of Suzette Lloyd is the enduring classic that allows people to comment on race relations on the island and say that slavery was never that bad. Benign, in fact, they've said. 
She says in one passage that the closeness between the enslaver and enslaved has its drawbacks. In speaking of enslaved women caring for white children, she says, for they give him everything he cries for. And if this does not pacify him, one woman will dance him on her knee while another sings and jumps and plays about. All this, of course, diverts baby excessively. And the Negroes seem to enjoy this sort of merriment quite as much as the child. Then too, they always have something nice to bestow. And therefore, as the children grow up, they still continue to follow them about. This, it is difficult to prevent as the servants' offices are close to the house, which always stands open. And from this constant intercourse with the Negroes, the children contract that disagreeable Creole drawl, which few ever entirely lose. The disagreeable Creole drawl. Anyone that has a Bermudian accent knows tourists love it, that when we travel, people love it. But within certain spaces here, the accent is only valued when it can be neutralized because then it sounds more British. Squeeze the Caribbean out of it, erase the African out of it, delete the black out of it, get rid of the disagreeable Creole drawl and show off your colonial dialect to demonstrate that you left the island for education or work. But please be prepared to trot it out for our entertainment. Two months before the dark and stormy video, we had the NBC Today show in Bermuda declared a huge win and a non-speaker of Bermudian English was asked to teach the hosts some Bermudian lingo. The struggle banter as he attempted to explain Ace Girl and Grease was remarked on extensively. Why and how was this person chosen? This is an ongoing issue in tourism everywhere. And here in Bermuda, the more research shows people want authentic culture, the more people pretend at it. Chingas, right in the heart of the city of Hamilton, there used to be a mural that featured Bermudian slang that had been designed by Dijon Simmons, founder of local culture group Burmeans, and was executed with support from Chustik, a grassroots arts foundation. A local, very preppy country club brand of clothing took the design of the mural and turned it into a belt. Chingas, their Instagram post said, Check out this dicty bout. As we know, Chingus was recently added to Oxford Dictionary thanks to Dr. Rosemary Hall, a Bermudian exclamation. Dicty, if Googled, is credited as African-American. And it is a word that black Bermudians use frequently. These are words that the owner of that clothing brand would likely never say unless in jest. And they use dicty incorrectly. They didn't credit the creatives, didn't reach out to them for collaboration, and they removed and limited comments from their Instagram. In this blog post, I also pointed out a mishmash of a tank top designed by a white non-Bermudian that don't even live here anymore. It had a bit of a tribal design and a gumbe, and it said, Ace Girl. And when exclaiming her glee at coming to the island to drop off these latest designs, she wrote, your Ace Girl is back Pondy Rock. I said, I'm done with our dialect being mass produced and worn by people who don't talk like this and would not even hire someone who did. At the time, the trend of the accent as entertainment and merchandise seemed fairly new to me. I was definitely used to mockery, but this felt different. It felt rooted in the new culture forward tourism strategy. But of course, as Dr. Hall has pointed out, it wasn't new. February, 2018 and friends. The Jeremy Frith and Friends Showcase event was advertised as a uniquely Bermudian night of spoken word. When I first saw the advertisement as part of the Bermuda Festival for the Performing Arts, my focus was mainly on the dope artists who would come under the and friends part of that showcase, one of whom is a close friend. But after chatting with her, I was concerned because it turned out, A, she didn't know who Jeremy Frith was, hadn't been fully aware that it was meant to be a tribute to him until uh, she'd agreed to be in the lineup. And B, since discovering this, she had read his poetry and was not excited. She told me he wrote in an exaggerated Bermudian accent. I immediately decided I wasn't going to go. But the festival is pretty much our top stage for performing arts and understandably, my friend didn't want to bow out and lose what could be a great opportunity. So. I bought my $50 ticket and went to support and had what can only be called an out of body experience. Hunched over in my trench coat, scarf on, bag on my arm, I spent three hours unsure if I was going to walk out, my body shivering at the far fetchedness of this night. Throughout the evening, they played recordings of Jeremy Frith, 
sometimes reciting his poetry, sometimes just talking about the things he was passionate about, the environment, chief among them. These underscored the difference in his regular voice, which did have a Romanian accent, and the exaggerated fake one that was put on for certain rhymes, especially those that reinforced how it really doesn't matter what ship your family came over on. It took me a while after to unpack all the emotions. I left myself voice notes, recorded a 35 minute video rant. It consumed my life. Obviously I knew before buying the ticket that the event was unlikely to be up my alley. And I joked that it would be worth the price if it helped inspire a think piece. But by the end of the night, I knew that anything I wrote would be super contentious. And I also knew that I would write it because that night was for me a monumental reinforcement that this type of thing needs to be called out that sitting in silence while your insides burn and people around you clap and laugh, blissful in their lack of awareness at your raging inferno, that this is no longer an option for me. Creatives tend to live in a world of extremes, so I vacillate between wanting to be just a writer who doesn't care or respond to anyone that doesn't get it, and my desire to have deep discussions and debates with people from all backgrounds who share a common goal of building a more just society. And I've done the latter for much of my career. But the issue is that the latter becomes problematic. As I wrote at the time, my feet got swollen and tired from running around trying to find the nuanced and acceptable ways to talk to people about their racism, patriarchy, homophobia, and general not niceness. So I edited the video clip rants and integrated them into four blog series that included this quote. How hard is it to accept that what was once thought of as innocent is actually an insensitive mockery, and in some cases, downright appropriation of the Bermudian accent and slang. That we have to recognize how the accent has been dragged through the mud, belittled, dismissed, and asked to reappear only for entertainment. That I recognize how I have been complicit. That these writings have been my way of shedding light on why I and so many others owe an apology to our dialect. For Black Bermudians, many of us have a complicated relationship with our accent. We love the way our vowels drag. We love saying that that person is Mycin. We sit with our friends and family, our community, and we sound like ourselves, but are told by well-meaning mentors and not so well-meaning co colleagues that we sound too Bermudian. We hear our accents parodied back at us, mocking. We see our isms worn like a costume. So in certain spaces, we choose to hide who we are and sadly, for some of us, it no longer becomes a choice. Sometimes species that have disappeared are found again. They're called Lazarus species, creatures thought to be extinct and rediscovered. In 1951, 18 surviving nesting pairs of cahals were found on rocky islets in Castle Harbor. I imagine the way they hid for 330 years, how they decided to become invisible in order to survive. And now after education and careful, remarkable and innovative local conservation efforts, there are 350 birds in the world. Now they are protected and celebrated. Maybe one day they will fill our skies and we will once again tilt our ears upward to hear that uniquely Bermudian sound. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. This was very powerful and beautiful. And um, so, yeah, thank you so, so much. And I want to say a huge thank you to the other presenters as well. The presentations were super interesting. I kept forgetting that I needed to help people in the background because I wanted to listen. I've learned a lot today. I really enjoyed them. And I hope you all who attended enjoyed them as well. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you all for presenting. I wish everyone a good rest of your days and from us um, from now is a goodbye.